Well, today we have a service call on a kitchen AC not working. Now the manager had tried to troubleshoot a few things himself and the manager told me that the main breaker actually showed me that the main breaker downstairs is in the tripped position. Now they had called me and said, hey, the breaker is you know, off. And I said, is it off or is it tripped? And then I had to explain to them the difference. And we confirmed over the phone that it was tripped. So I said, leave it alone. Don't touch it. Just leave it be and go ahead and place the service call. So they placed the service call and I get here today and yes, it certainly is tripped. So I went ahead and turned it into the off position. And now we're gonna jump into this unit and uh, see what potentially could have caused a main breaker to trip. Now, let's think about this. What's the purpose of the main breaker? The purpose of the main breaker is to protect the main power feed from a direct short or from a massive overcurrent situation, right? Uh, it also protects the wiring coming up to the unit and protects you know, it from basically having some sort of a problem that would cause the uh, main power feed coming into the building to have a potential direct short or a high overcurrent situation. Now this is an actual circuit breaker, okay? So first thing I'm gonna check, we're gonna walk up to this unit, we're gonna open it up and it is turned off uh, downstairs, okay? And right up here, I came up here and the first thing I did was turn this off, okay? So now what we can do is we can go downstairs and we can turn on the main breaker, okay? Well, I should say we need to be careful about that. Before we turn on the main breaker, what we really should do is with it off, we should open this panel up and see if there's anything inside of here on the line voltage side of this safety switch. Now this looks like a breaker, but it's not. But let me open it up and I'll explain it. All right, so if you look inside of here, this is a safety switch. It looks just like a circuit breaker, but it's not. Even though it says 150 amps, that's just the amount of current that this switch can handle. If you read right here, provides no overcurrent protection. So this is merely just a safety switch, okay? We're gonna grab incoming power, zero volts. We're gonna check across the phases, zero, we got two volts. And let's go across this one. Nothing, we got nothing across this guy. My chopstick action is not as strong as it should be today. So we have no power. Next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna test to see if we have any direct shorts to ground. Now, I'm just using the audible tone because we're looking for a major direct short, okay? We're not doing an insulation test. We're just testing direct short to ground. So we're gonna test on this panel. We've got an audible beep. We have a green light. So then we're gonna go from each leg to ground nothing and then we're gonna keep proceeding across and all that we're doing here is making sure that there's no direct short to ground before I go downstairs and reset the circuit breaker that is tripped or that was tripped right nothing we have no direct shorts to ground let's go ahead and check on the load side okay all right let's make our life easier okay now we know so look right here I clamped onto that this guy, nothing, this guy, nothing, this guy, nothing. And again, up top, nothing, nothing, nothing. Okay, so what does that tell us? That tells us that there is no direct shorts to ground coming from the circuit breaker to here, right? Or coming from here to the compressor contactors, okay? So let's go ahead and open this guy up and have a look what's going on in here. I like these older Linux units. I guess I like them just because I'm used to them, right? So we're gonna look in here. So main power is coming up into here. So we tested from the safety switch to here, and then it goes right here, all the way to the top of each contactor. Now we're not testing the load side of the contactors, we're just testing the incoming side. We go in there and, oh look right there. We got something burnt right here. Look at that. Oh. Oh, and if you look at it, the contactor is kind of halfway pulled in on the first stage. Interesting. Let's look at the top. Looks like we got some burning action going on the top too. All of these look like they're overheating, but these ones have black. So 
let's open this contactor up and have a look. Got the cover off that contactor and uh, to me, it looks like it's welded shut. I mean, not to me, it is. The contactor's welded shut, so. Interesting, it looks like all three phases are welded shut. That's intriguing. Um, so that is the compressor. So this is the blower, compressor one, two, and three. So compressor one, two, three. If you look right here, compressor one has been overheating to the point that the paint is peeling off the compressor. So that's not good. Let's start by, you always wanna be careful when you're pulling these Molex plugs off because the, the, um, the disc, I mean the, the little pins can be broken and you can actually yank them out of it depending on certain situations. So always get away from it and be ready. Pull them off carefully. Don't see any damage in there. Now let's go ahead and test these pins to find out if we have any direct shorts or if we even have winding continuity. Do we have open windings or is there an actual connection? Now this is a three phase compressor. But before we test those, we're actually gonna disconnect these leads right here. Well, actually no, we can because we disconnected it here. The point I was making was because that contactor is welded shut, if we tested them with power still hooked up, theoretically, we would be testing all the way back here, but we pulled the Molex plug. I wasn't thinking straight. So now let me get my meter set up and we're gonna test to see if we still have a good compressor or not. First and foremost, we're testing for direct shorts to ground, again, using the audible tone feature, and it's gonna give us a resistance value too. I verified that we do have a good ground. Notice that I've got them both there. We have a good ground, okay? So we're testing to see if the compressor itself is grounded out. Terminal one, no. Terminal two, no. Terminal three, no. We are not grounded out. So now we are gonna test the windings themselves to see if we have resistance across the windings or if we have an open winding. So it looks like, and it is not hot, this compressor is nice and cool. We have open windings on this compressor. I'm testing all three, nothing. So this compressor has completely open windings. The motor inside has an open, it's, it's shorted. Something has happened to where the motor no longer has resistance across the three phases. So this is a bad compressor, okay? Now the question is, is there any more damage besides this one compressor? Now this is an original 2004 compressor. Uh, it's hard to say at this point right now what caused the damage, but let's go ahead and keep checking compressor two and compressor three to see if there's any problems with those and the indoor blower motor because, you know, we might be able to get this unit going without just one compressor. So we're gonna dig through this a little bit more. Same thing, made sure we have a good ground. We do? Oh. Oh no, that, okay, so yeah, we're good. Just making sure that we're grounded, we are, okay. So let's go ahead and set this guy right here. And we're gonna test the other legs, okay? So we're testing the load side of the contactors. Nothing, nothing, nothing. No direct shorts, nothing, 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 okay? Both of those contactors do not have any direct shorts to ground. Let's check the blower contactor. This one is opposite. Nothing, nothing, nothing. I don't see any issues. None of the other contactors look bad. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna isolate the power for this. We're gonna disconnect the power and isolate the wires. And then once we do that, we're gonna try to turn this guy on and see if we can get the rest of the unit All right. I went ahead and pulled the main power wires, the line voltage coming into the contactor all the way back from this terminal block right here. Here's the wires. It was super easy, just disconnected them. But it's not just as simple as that because if you look, there's two other power wires going to that line voltage. And if we follow those back, that's power for this transformer, which reduces from 208 volts down to 24 volts. And it says for contactors. That right there, it has two transformers. This one is the power for the contactors. So we need to switch that over because this no longer has voltage going to it, so we're gonna switch it over to this other contactor right here, put it onto these line voltage terminals, okay? So then that way, this guy is now powered from the line voltage coming into that contactor. And we'll do the same on this other pink wire right here. 
And then once we do that, I got to get this 24 volts disconnected too because we don't want it to try to come on because we don't know if there's any issues there. Of all things to be out of, I'm out of black electrical tape. I only had blue, but whatever. All right, so we got low voltage isolated. They're not taped together. They're individually taped and then taped to the wires. We can leave this connected. It doesn't make a difference. Uh, contactor is completely disconnected. The transformer power for the secondary transformer is transferred over to that contactor. So at this point, um, we're gonna turn on power to the unit because we don't see any other direct shorts to ground. And we wanna see if uh, there's anything else going on with this guy. I am probing up with my uh, job link probes and we're gonna set it up on measure quick so we can evaluate the rest of the unit. Before I leave, I am gonna verify whether or not there is refrigerant in the circuit of the non-functioning compressor because even though the compressor doesn't run, I need to know that information if I quote it, right? I'm still gonna quote new refrigerant, but if I find out that it doesn't have any refrigerant, that tells me that I'm gonna be doing a leak search also, okay? Now, there's no way to know if it has enough refrigerant, but we'll check it, right? So um, I'm probing up on this, very important, before you probe up, now you can see that I already actuated one of my Schrader core depressors, but it's very important before you turn measure quick on and before you turn the system on that you zero out your probes notice that the high side pressure is still at zero psi you need to see zero psi before you do that now i'm using these appion schrader core depressors these things are awesome no more refrigerant blowback spray off or anything like that all they're there is just to depress the schraders they work really good on the uh, core max fittings too uh, i picked them up from truetechtools.com uh, if you go to truetechtools.com, look for the Appion Schrader core depressors. Let's see if there's a part number. I don't know if there's a part number, but I'm sure it's not too difficult to find them. Um, but yeah, truetechtools.com. Use my offer code big picture, one word. When you use that, you get an 8% discount on most of the items, and then I get a small commission from it. You can also use it for the job link probes, all the different stuff, temperature clamps. Um, so check it out, truetechtools.com. All right, so. Um, we're probing up on this one, and then we're gonna probe up on this one. Now, I don't have enough of the uh, Schrader core depressors to do this, the, the next stage, so I'll have to use normal ones, but it's okay, you know. Um, so at this point, we're just gonna get those probed up, and then we'll uh, profile measure quick, and then test the rest of the system. Perfect example, low pressure two and high pressure two. Look at this. This one right here is reading negative 1.7 PSI. So, if I don't zero that out, it will throw off my reading. So now you need to see zero PSI on both of them before you apply them to the system. A lot of people ask me about probe placement. Like where should you be putting your probes when you're working on equipment? Well, there's perfect case scenarios and there's real world scenarios, right? I'm working on a package unit, real world scenario. You know, I am gonna put my discharge line temperature clamp you know, 18 inches away from the discharge of the compressor because you want it to not grab the heat from the compressor, right? So I'm gonna put it about right there. But you know, you can see that the closer, the further you put it away, it's gonna rub on other discharge lines and pick up the temperature from those. So, you know, ideally I'd say put it a little bit further away, but then it'll be mixing with the other discharge lines. Already it's close enough here. Um, low pressure is pretty obvious on the low side, high pressure. Uh, what about suction line? Well, suction line is not too bad right here, but you need to pay attention to a few things. I mean, I guess, you know, some may argue it should be a little bit closer to the evaporator. Yeah, there's probably a fair argument, but I'm just gonna go with this right here. But we gotta make sure that we have insulation, right? So now it's getting the temperature actually coming back to the compressor. So we're more or less checking compressor superheat, which is fine, okay? But you wanna make sure that it's insulated in the cabinet if possible and, you know, after. Now, what about liquid line temperature? Well, liquid line temperature you want coming out of the condenser. Uh, I could take off the panels and grab directly out of the filter dryer. That would probably be ideal, coming directly out of the filter dryer. But uh, I'm gonna go ahead and check right here, or you could get closer to the expansion valve because it's coming out, it's going discharge line, into the condenser, out of the condenser, liquid line, and then it's going to the expansion valve. So I guess some might argue that maybe you should put it a little closer to the expansion valve. I don't see a problem with it right here, okay? Now, what about air probes? Well, on this particular unit, the air probes are pretty important because you have a giant side of a condenser right there and you have a giant side of the condenser right there. 
but notice we have three compressors, okay? So um, the top half of this condenser is one stage. The bottom half of this and the bottom half of that is one stage, and then the top half of that is another stage. So it depends on what circuit you're testing. Uh, you know, if you have a lot of shade and then you have a lot of heat coming off the roof, you may need to maybe move your air probe for outside air, depending on what circuit you're testing. Now, what about supply air and return air? Well, let's come over here. On a supply air, ideally, you wanna be down in the building at like one of the first registers, okay? But that's not very practical because I have customers in the building. So again, you have perfect world and real world, right? So we're gonna have to go here, but we have to remember that going right here, right? Now, another thing to think about too, this cabinet is not necessarily supply air, okay? Because you've got return air coming up through here, going through the evaporator coil, blower wheel going downstairs, okay? So this is gonna be the best supply air measurement anywhere from this point down. Perfect world, down at the first register, but that's not very practical. Hey, check this out. Look at this duct detector. It's got water in it. Oh, well, that's interesting. We need to bring that up to them. This duct detector has got water or had water in it at one point. So that might be malfunctioning. That's cool. Um, but anyways, so we're gonna go here, but we have to keep in mind that we are very close to the heat exchanger. So if we were testing heating, we could be getting radiant heat coming off the heat exchanger. Um, and we're probably a little bit close to the evaporator air. I guess the evaporator in cooling mode, this is a little bit safer. Let's have a look too, look at that. Looks like there's oil all over this uh, blower motor. There's like grease in there too. That blower motor's in pretty bad shape. Interesting. Um, so what about return air? Let's go over here. Return air, ideally we want it down in the building, okay? If we have the outside air dampers closed. Now in this situation, the outside air dampers are closed, but once we turn the unit on, they might open up a little bit and mix outside air with the return air from downstairs. Also, filters are plugged on this guy. These are very, very dirty. Um, so, you know, this really should be about here in this situation, but in a perfect world, we get it downstairs at the return so long as the outside air dampers are closed. Now, for testing purposes, you really should be closing your outside air dampers, and if you don't wanna mess with the, uh, the economizer settings for this particular unit, all you need to do is disconnect the actuator, but be cautious disconnecting actuators because sometimes it can cause errors and create problems. So if this economizer was gonna open, the actuator now won't open and it stays closed, so we're getting just building air. For testing purposes, that's best, all right? Uh, because the rated information for the unit is gonna be without mixing outside air, okay? So now we are ready to turn this guy on. I've turned on the power downstairs already. So now we're cycling on and we're gonna wait for this guy to stage on. Looks like we're going through its startup feature right now, okay? And uh, we're gonna wait for it to turn on and then we'll be able to test the rest of the system. All right, let's go through this. This guy is an R22 system, but it's not set up yet as a two-stage unit. So we need to set it up. So we're gonna go into measure quick, we're gonna go right here, and we're gonna do multi-circuit, multiple sets of probes for multiple circuits, two to four compressors. Multi-circuit, we're gonna select two circuit, oh, I accidentally selected three, we need to select two. So multi-circuit, we're gonna select two. Because one circuit's dead, so there's no point in testing it that way. We also gotta do some interpolation or whatever because this is a 15-ton unit, but we're only running as a 10-ton because we're only running two compressors. So. Uh, circuit one, circuit two. All right, now what we do is go to profile and then we're gonna go ahead and set it up as a package unit. We're doing a quick and dirty test. So we're gonna set it up as a five ton for the first stage. Um, TXV 13 to 16 sear, that's fine. Let's go ahead and switch circuits to the second stage, set it up as a five ton. So now we have 10 tons of active cooling right here, total active cooling 10, all right. Uh, that's pretty much it, it's a TXV system. And we are waiting for the system to turn on so that way we can test the circuits. We have first and second stage. So once it turns on and we let it stabilize out, we'll be able to evaluate first and se or second and third stage technically. Program, and let's go ahead and set current day.
Perfect. With that old Honeywell stat, you really got to make sure that you're setting the time on them. That was the Ultra stat. That was a really popular thermostat that we used in the 2000s. All right, so all my compressors are running now. It has not stabilized, but we can kind of uh, get a general idea here what we're looking at. Just, you know, on startup. Okay, let's see the second stage. All right, so let's let it stabilize out. Looks like maybe we need to move an outside air probe, maybe. Let's see what outside air says. Outdoor air says 69 degrees. Hold on a second. Do I have some probes swapped around, maybe? Let's see. High pressure looks like it's low on batteries. That sucks. All right, let's go down here. Outdoor air 70. Supply air 62, return air 72. I gotta make sure that we have, I I'm pretty sure I have those right. I ended up just moving the outside air probe because it was getting a little skewed reading. So let's go back here and we can go back into the system. So circuit one, let's go ahead and go back right on over here. I mean, it's weird that we're still, yeah, we've got some really high head pressure for the ambient temperature. Okay, let's see what second stage kind of doing the same thing you know what I wonder low ambient kit we're not running first stage condenser fan motor I don't think let's look over here because first stage isn't running it's missing a fan motor potentially two fan motors over there are not running they should all be running at this point so uh, let's test to make sure we don't have any bad motors it could just be a pressure switch because that is a low ambient pressure switch or a fan cycling switch and since the first stage isn't running, it's possible that could be a problem. All right, I got them all to run. They're all running now. All I did uh, was grab the relays right here and move the wires to the top side of the relay. But we still don't know if it's a pressure switch causing them to not run or if it's a bad relay. We'll have to dig into that more. But at this point, we're gonna let it stabilize out with all the condenser fan motors running and then kind of evaluate it from there. So it's been running for a little bit. It's still not completely stabilized out, but I think we're okay. And let me explain. But first off, first stage, nothing's too crazy, right? Superheat's about where it should be. Subcooling's a tiny bit high, but nothing too crazy. Second stage, kind of the same. Superheat's about where it should be. It's a little bit high. Subcooling's a little bit high. Now on second stage, let's go ahead and go on over here. Uh, temperature splits about 12 degrees. Airflow is about 4,000 CFMs. Uh, delivered capacity is about 50,000 BTUs. I don't know if that's quite accurate and it might just be probe placement that's throwing that number off. Again, remember, you have to be careful trusting these temp splits and stuff because of your air probe placement. But I'm not seeing anything scary with the refrigerant pressures, okay? Next thing, this unit needs some love. The filters need to be changed. The uh, the pulleys for the indoor blower motor are worn out. They're not moving enough air. The belt's a little bit loose. Outside air filters are damaged right here. You can see there, the bird screen is like damaged. You can stick your finger through there. These need to be replaced. The condenser could use a cleaning. It's not horrible looking, but I know it could use a cleaning. It's also the fins are kind of flattened down. They're kind of worn out too. When you wash them, it kind of bends them pretty good, okay? Um, but all the condenser fan motors are working. So at this point, what we're gonna do is we're gonna give the customer a big picture quote. My quote is gonna be to replace the pulleys, put a new belt on it, put new air filters in it, disassemble and properly clean the uh, condenser, possibly the evaporator if it needs it, change this compressor, new refrigerant for this compressor, new compressor contactor, replace the smoke detector that's full of water, or ha was full of water. Um, these relays are pretty smoked when you look in there. Look at that, that's pretty bad inside there. Those relays are pretty worn out, right? So we're gonna talk to them about all this stuff and see what they wanna do. Now this is an old R22 unit from 2004. They may opt to replace the unit. I don't know, okay? But I got them running for now. The original call was a trip circuit breaker. So now it's time for a quote, but at least they have some cooling, right? It's currently March, so hopefully they approve this in the next couple weeks to the next month before it starts warming up because April, May, June, July, August, September, October is gonna be getting pretty darn warm, right? 
progressively as the months go on. So we know though that we have an operating unit now. We know that we have a bad compressor. What killed the compressor? I don't really know. And I won't really know until we uh, actually go through the system. Now, while we're here, let's go ahead and check this, okay? So we've already verified that we're good. So we're gonna take this guy off. Hold on. Okay, there's that. Wait for, oh, we gotta, because there's still some trapped gas in here. There we go, okay. No more gas. High pressure should go to zero. Give it a second. Oh, that's not the right circuit, that's why. There we go, high pressure's at zero, okay. Now we're gonna put high pressure on this one. Make sure it's not depressed. Put high pressure on this one. Then we're gonna go ahead and check it. Put it on, see if we have gas in here. High pressure has 122 PSI of refrigerant. So we have refrigerant in the system. Now let's test it. Now you notice that when I depressed it last time, when I took it off, there was still some trapped gas. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna kinda spray that on my finger and smell the refrigerant to see if it's possibly burnt. I don't think it's burnt, but we'll test it real quick. And then that's it. We'll give them the big picture quote and uh, we'll let them know, you know, and see what they wanna do. Interesting enough, even though the compressor isn't testing as grounded, that refrigerant smells burnt. Now it's a rudimentary test, right? We could do an acid test, but there's not a really good way to do an acid test on this guy because in order to do a proper acid test, you really need oil. The oil is where the acid test is going to happen, but I smell burnt refrigerant. Therefore, we are going to diagnose this as a grounded compressor or a compressor that's bad that has burnt oil. Okay. We're changing the compressor. We're changing the refrigerant anyways. We're going to do a proper cleanup procedure, which is going to be using, um, HH core Sporlin dryers, which are high wax removal due to acid, okay? It's not high acid removal, it's high wax removal. So we'll make that part of our quote. And uh, this is why we don't just turn it on, right? We look at the big picture. We're giving them a big picture quote. So that way they can make an informed decision. Compressor, contactor, you know, pulleys, smoke detector, uh, new belts, Condenser needs to be clean, you know, relays that are bad. Uh, we should probably pop the covers. Uh, I'm gonna tell you right now that I can guarantee those are original contactors, and I can guarantee those contactors are gonna be pitted too. So let's open those up and have a look. It's not horrible, but it's definitely got some burning action going on inside that contactor, right? See that one? And then look down into here, same thing. You can see it, so this guy needs all new contactors. Let's look at this one, the blower. That one doesn't look as bad, but it's kind of burnt in there too. So we're definitely gonna be giving them a lot of stuff here and then letting them make an informed decision on whether or not this unit is worth repairing to them or if it's time to replace. Now, it's not my job to tell them repair or replace. I will give them a suggestion, but I am not the decision maker. It is the customer that makes the decision on whether or not they wanna repair or replace. I will just give them, you know, my expert opinion I wouldn't say expert, my, my opinion, because <laughs> I'm not an expert at anything. Uh, I just know a lot about a little, right? Or a little about a lot. Um, but yeah, that's it. That's all we're gonna do on this one. And uh, we'll definitely uh, give them the quote and we'll catch you on the next one. So time will tell what the customer wants to do. I don't know, but I got the equipment back up and running. That was the important thing, right? Because they had no air conditioning. Then I was able to disconnect the compressor and get it back up and running. Now. They certainly can't leave it running for that long because those other contactors, they're going to become a problem. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of things that could have caused the compressor to go bad. It could have simply just been a bad contactor, right? Those were all original contactors. This customer doesn't do normal routine maintenance. The contactor could have just gone bad, right? Um, it could have been just arcing because it wasn't making a good connection, getting hot. Who knows? It's hard to say. And part of my quote to the customer is going to be an explanation that I won't know what killed that compressor until we replace it, right? And then after we replace it, we'll be able to further evaluate the system to see if there's any other problems. And that's the way that we always give these quotes when we have bad compressors, especially if we have no history, no, no data telling us that it was starting to go bad or, you know, it was running with low refrigerant or, you know, what, who knows? 
we never go out there and say, it just needs a compressor and it'll be fixed and perfect. No, because we don't know that. Okay. So I always like to let them know ahead of time, like, Hey, you know, this is what you need to do. So again, when I mentioned in the video, my job is to give the customer all the information and let them make an informed decision. This unit is 20 years old. Maybe it's time to consider replacement. So, you know, I will recommend that to the customer. Hey, I really think that you should consider replacing this, but inevitably it's their decision. I, I don't make that decision, right? I'm not going and saying, I refuse to work on it. You have to change it. No, you know, I'm not saying that I'll never do that, but in this situation, no, I can fix this. I certainly can. It'll be rather expensive, but you know, maybe the customer wants to do that. You know, a lot of people wonder, you know, why is it that my customers are willing to spend so much money fixing their equipment? And that's because the cost to replace equipment here in our area of Southern California is so ridiculously high that oftentimes, you know, uh, changing a unit like this, I mean, it could be, you know, if I had to guess 35 grand, like, you know, I mean, it could be a lot of money, right? It would be a lot of money to replace this unit. I don't know though. Now in my situation, this particular customer, I wouldn't be selling them a new unit. This customer buys their own equipment. They buy it direct from Linux. So I would just be doing the installation of the new equipment. So it wouldn't cost them that much because I wouldn't be getting a markup in that equipment and stuff, but they'd certainly be spending a lot of money to have new equipment installed. And, you know, so you know, again, I just give them all the information and, you know, they make their informed decisions. I can't stress enough though, right? Talk to your customers, tell them, do not reset circuit breakers. If a circuit breaker is tripped, something happened. Okay. They need to investigate that before they try to reset it. Had this customer gone and reset that, you know, maybe they would have caused a severe burn inside that compressor on off on off. Who knows? You know, it's hard to say, or maybe there could have been other damage. So you want to encourage them. Don't reset circuit breakers. If a circuit breaker is tripped, stop and let a technician. That's what I advise them. Let us come out and go through it. It's better safe than sorry. You don't want to create a bigger problem. I once had a customer where I'm not kidding with you, the cook reset the circuit breaker so many times that he ruined the entire main electrical panel. Multiple bus bars were burnt. It was a three phase system. They had, mul I mean, the whole thing had melted. The cook was literally just standing there. Every time he, he told me, he goes, I, I'll stand here and I turn it on and then boom, it goes bad. And then I'll just turn it on and then boom, it goes bad. And he goes, I just kept doing it over and over and over again. Now, long story, this was long before I was doing YouTube videos. So I convinced the customer, this was a huge electrical panel. They had to get an electrician out. They had to change breakers, bus bars. It was a big giant thing, right? And then the electrician miswired the phases and then ruined multiple other compressors on that roof because they turned it on and didn't have us come out and they just let the equipment run. And it was old equipment and it just ran and ran and ran. And then I'm not joking with you, we had like four compressors that we had to replace after they did that. And it, they were all working before. It was, that was a crazy story. I wish I had some footage from that because there's all kinds of cool stuff that I had long before I was doing YouTube videos. But regardless, Big picture stuff, right? Big picture diagnoses. Always take a step back and look at the big picture. That way you can give your customer a more informed evaluation. That way they can make more informed decisions. Same thing goes with your company, routine maintenance. Take a big picture step or take a step back and look at the big picture when you're doing routine maintenance. You know, start really thinking about things. Why did that part fail? Figure it out. Dig into it. Try to figure it out. Take the part apart. Look into it. You know, that kind of stuff, right? Hey, if you're interested in uh, supporting the channel, there's a couple different ways that you can do so. The easiest way is literally just watch these videos from beginning to end. That really is the easiest way. Uh, you can also support the channel via PayPal, Patreon, or YouTube channel memberships with all uh, monthly commitments that you make. There's links in the show notes for it, any one of those. You can learn more about them. You can also support the channel by going to my website, hvacrvideos.com. Uh, you saw the merch teaser at the beginning. Uh, you can find merchandise on there. We have hats, beanies, sweatshirts, t-shirts, all that good stuff available on the website. Last but not least, truetechtools.com. If you go to truetechtools.com, you see any of the tools like the, the Appian core depressors that I was using in this, go to truetechtools.com, use my offer code BIGPICTURE. 
Uh, that's one word on most items. You'll get an 8% discount and I get a small commission from that. So that's another great way to help support the channel. So there's a lot of different methods. I'd really appreciate you uh, if you'd consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. And uh, that's it. Again, thank you so very much. And uh, we will catch you on the next one, okay?